The penultimate round of the IndyCar season would take the sport to Portland, uh, one of my favourite circuits on the calendar, mainly because of the first corner having the special ability of causing utter chaos. With a silly season and an X racist to add into the mix, we've got a lot to dive into. So, hey there guys, I'm Will. Welcome to FP1, the comedy review, and roll the intro. Right then, let's start with the news, and if you're wondering why this video is so late, it's this section and the dread I feel trying to cover it all. With Formula 1's silly season about as exciting as Chip Ganassi in bed, before he flattens you, anyway the point is, IndyCar's driver market has more than made up for that. Despite Pelot likely remaining at CGR, some big seats are still available. One of the most popular of these was Grosjean's spotter Andretti. The Frenchman had a superb start to the year, which was only curtailed by unlucky crashes and incidents that weren't really his fault, then by more incidents that rather were his fault. That, plus Chip Ganassi taking money out of Ericsson's contract for Pelot's impending court battle, led to Marcus making the jump to Andretti for 2024 and the Phoenix being tossed into the dirt. Ericsson's spot would then be taken by Linus Tech Tips here, and I'm glad. For him, obviously, but also now because one of my videos will age well for once. Grosjean, meanwhile, has been linked with a reunion with Dale Coyne Racing, which sadly means the demise of Stingray Rob. Looks like that's the end of my IndyCar coverage then. Now that's all for 2024, but the city season doesn't really stop there, as after suffering one round of Connor Daly, Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan decided it would rather field a racist for the remaining two races. Yuri Vips hasn't driven a race car since leaving a championship that openly admitted to wishing he would f off. However, having gone under some BS PR rehabilitation, he's been fired a lifeline. Interestingly, we never hear from him on the radio though. Guess that was too much of a risk from the NBC crew. On the bright side, we did get this stunning summary of his racing career that looks like it was made on PowerPoint. That was shown during practice, and rather interestingly, IndyCar have now extended their highlights packages to these sessions to almost half an hour. Rather confusing where they found the highlights from, though. I'll be honest with you all, practice one was a little bit boring this week. A few cars straight line turn one, and Rosenquist forgot he still had one weekend left with McLaren as he straight lined it into the wall, but otherwise, that was pretty much it. Oh, and Ryan Hunter raised dementia kicked in. But yeah, besides that, all else you need to know is that Lungard topped the session, and enjoy looking at his name at the top of the standings because he becomes completely irrelevant after this. P2 would at least be a little more interesting as Grosjean decided it was time to do Grosjean things, even bringing Callum Eilot for a ride towards the end. We'd have red flags too, and having managed to go a whole video without mentioning his name at all last week, Stingray was back to his best here in Portland. We likely won't have many more opportunities to use this, so enjoy. Some drivers had a bit more skill, however, Will Power pulling a pretty impressive save later on. It would be teammate Scott McLaughlin, though, who topped the session, with Joseph Newgarden finding some pace again just a little too late after being bumped from the championship last week. Newgarden clearly remembered this come qualifying, as he chose to make sure he was definitely out of contention by beaching his car in the barriers early on. Grosjean was another to go out early as he exploded Bahrain style towards his mechanics, which, if you didn't know, is Racing Driver 101 when you're in dire need of a seat next year. Yuri Vips, meanwhile, was trying to take his career to some sort of height through Turn 1, and Marcus Ericsson thought he saw Will Power again and got scared driving over onto the grass. Incidents sure were a plenty in this quali session, here's Benjamin Peterson continuing not to use his mirrors and finding an alternative way to look behind him. Bit strange this really, as he's usually last anyway. As we got to the fast six, however, it was Graham Rahal once again taking pole position. Not gonna lie, that doesn't hit as hard as it did a few weeks ago, but congratulations and Yep, let's watch NBC show the video of him crying again. Ray Hall later came out, warning his rivals that their race car was going to be even better. Ray Hall finished 12th. We'll get to the rest of the race in a moment, but first I want to beg for some subs. You see, I'm trying to get the channel to 100k and make this my full-time job in the process. If you'd like to help out with that, then subscribing down below would go a super long way. Thanks to everyone who did this after the last video, as we genuinely saw some of the best growth this channel has ever seen in the god knows how many years I've been doing this. 
Now back to the action. Portland Turn 1 has always seen tons of drama, so in a year where Stingray Rob, Benjamin Peterson and Yuri Vips all line up on the same grid, apparently nothing happened. Rahal held the lead as Pelot got past championship rival Dixon, and as usual, we got our customary super side-by-side -side battling all throughout lap one. The McLaren sure got feisty, pushing each other off onto the grass and causing a smoke screen that launched Roman Grosjean into the air and out of the race. Though, with his engineers hoping for a bit more peace and quiet, they sent him out 10 laps later to shut him up. That incident didn't bring a caution though, a decision that Will Power clearly wasn't a fan of, as the reigning world champion proceeded to rectify this on lap 3. With the Penske driver a lap down and out of contention, we got going again, Ray Hall leading from McLaughlin and Pelot. At this point, we noticed that the red-walled Firestone tyres were seemingly swapped out for F1's Pirellis over the weekend. Several cars were diving into the box early, and this included Colton Herter, who once again proved that he didn't know what a pit limiter was. This is also where Ray Hall's race would begin to fall apart. He was able to cover against McLaughlin, but by the time Pelot came into the pits much later, he managed to find 10 seconds out of seemingly nowhere. Do I know how he did this? Not a clue, so I'm just going to move on. Pelot's next stop would come on lap 49, though upon exiting the pits, he got a bit forceful with Castro Neves, in a move that in my opinion probably deserved a blocking penalty. IndyCar stewards promptly told me to go f*** myself though. So with the win for Pelot now more than assured, we could at least be treated to some excellent racing further down the pack. Renus VK was sure having a fun afternoon, especially for a man so irrelevant this might actually be the first time I've brought him up in these videos. There was more drama going on in the battle for Rookie of the Year. Marcus Armstrong was looking in good stead despite missing out on the ovals, though his Ganassi crew being secret Canapino supporters clearly wasn't helping him much. Talking of Canapino, he was now in a pretty decent position. Actually, never mind, our boys f***ed it. This would bring out a caution. Eventually, you see IndyCar officials seem to feel bad for Felix Rosenquist for some reason. He was yet to box and so was allowed time to pit before the race was neutralised. Shockingly enough, this move didn't make the stewards particularly popular with the drivers. With lap cars giving Pillow a nice buffer and Rosenquist needing to look after his tyres anyway, from there it was a fairly straightforward journey to the chequered flag. Pillow crossed the line after 110 laps to win the race. Oh, what, in the championship as well? Sorry, I didn't think the coverage ever brought that up. Pillow was the first man since Sebastian Bourdais to win the IndyCar title with races left remaining. Not the most famous of names to follow in the footsteps of, but in all seriousness, fair play to the Spaniard. He's driven a hell of a year, and that consistent driving sure has paid off. Can't wait to see him spend those winnings on a lawyer now, though. Some will argue that holding out the caution was a bit sus from the stewarding department, though honestly, I don't really care. Yes, it might have given Dixon more of a shot, but Pelot was winning that title anyway. If not here, then next week at Laguna Seca. We'll head over there next, but if you enjoyed the comedy review, be sure to drop it a like and get subscribed if you haven't already. I've got to give a huge thank you to my patrons and channel members as well. They get early access to some of my videos, so if that's something you're interested in, or just supporting me and the channel, then you can find out more through the links in the description below. For now though, that's all from me. I'll be seeing you next week for the finale, but until then, have a good one.